All right, let's make our old confession. Come on, this is my Bible. I am, I'm doing, I'm having everything it says I should have. When I hear God's word today, I believe it, I receive it through my ears, down into my heart, lived out through my life, so I'll never be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen. Remain standing as I read from Psalms 126. Psalms 126, starting at verse 1, it says, When the Lord turned, the ca again, the captivities of, of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, that's the unbelievers, who think that these faith-believing people of God are crazy, they said, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless, no doubt about it, come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You may be seated. I want to speak today as we are again preparing for our Super Seed Sundays, asking all the leaders who are prepared to be able to, to do that next Sunday. And for those of you who have not been part of this, this is a great, exciting day at Right Direction when we have our Super Seed Sunday, uh, I kick it off, then I ask our leaders to come and say what the Lord has put on their hearts to give in a great, abundant, above average, everybody say above average? Above average. An above average way. I'm talking about our Super Seed Sunday, praise the Lord. And, uh, and so people come forward and show and speak of what they're giving, and we rejoice over every gift. Amen. Whether it's $100 or $100,000, we rejoice over every gift because every gift together helps us do what we do. And there's a synergetic effect, which means that the sum is greater than its parts. And that's why the Bible said two are better than one because we have a greater reward for our labor of getting together. That's why you get married to do better. Let me say it again. That's why you get married to do better. You don't get, just get married because you want to have legitimate sex. You get married because you want to do better. Later on, you find out there ain't enough if you ain't doing better. Come on, you, do, you get married so you can do better. This is a partnership. My life is better because I'm with you. We have more together than we ever would have had individually. That's the purpose of marriage, partnership. And so that's what we do when we come in our Super Seed Sunday. And then, so all the leaders who prepared to do that next week, and then also everyone else on the 28th, and those of you who want to, after you hear this mess today, you may just want to run up here today and say, I got to get my seed in the ground right now. And so then everyone will be prepared as we celebrate 28 years of ministry. Amen. And so many of us are going to be sowing a precious seed. And we're going to talk about that. A, Precious seed, because the promise of the scripture from Psalm 126 is that, that he that goeth forth and weepeth bearing or sowing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves. His sheaves is a great abundance of harvest with him. That verse from the New Living Translation of Psalm 126, 5 and 6, it says, those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. I said, shouts of joy. Shouts of joy. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seed, but they sing as they return with the harvest. The message translation puts all those verse four through six together. The message translation says, and now God do it again. Bring rains to our drought-stricken lives so those who planted their crops in despair 
will shout hurrahs at the harvest. So those who went off with heavy hearts will come home laughing with arm loads of blessings. Come on, somebody put your arms out. Say, God, give me a bless me with arm loads of blessings. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Arm loads of blessings. I'm prophesying over somebody's super seed already. God, get ready to bless you with arm loads of blessings. Hallelujah. That's just promise from the scriptures. So let me tell you all a story. Some of you heard the story, but for the purpose of this introduction, usually I tell my stories and I rush through them real quick because some of y'all heard them and I still got, I'm, I'm a little triggered. I'm a little triggered because years ago somebody got offended. You know, people get offended with the pastor. You know, people, you know, and people get offended. That, that's why I told our leaders and I, I told our, our uh, uh, servant, uh, what, what y'all call then? <laughs> health ministers. I told the health ministers yesterday that you got to have a relationship with the Lord that goes beyond the relationship with your pastor. You have to have a relationship with the Lord that goes beyond the people who you like it at the church. Because as soon as something goes wrong with the people you, don't, you, like, you, don't, you like at the church, then you will, leave the, you will leave the church and then leave the Lord. And as soon as you get mad with the pastor, I don't like that. I don't, you know, we, years ago, some of y'all don't know, I, I used to watch this in the early days. We had a whole nother place now. In the early days of our church, y'all see how we do and how we do things. And there's no pressure. I don't want no pressure on anybody. I, had, I used to have people, as we get ready to prepare for Super Seed Sunday, people would leave the church. Leaders. They would leave because they didn't want to give. And you don't want to give, don't. We're going to, some... You, you, you all understand this God's church. Okay? One knee brew don't stop no show. <laughs> Some of y'all know knee brews is ask somebody, look it up in the Greek. Okay? <clears throat> um, and so there people get offended. People, people get offended for all kinds of reasons. And so, sometimes you have to ask yourself, what, what am I really offended about? Sometimes, most of the time, um, we take offense. Offense is something you take. That's why one person can say something, some of them will laugh about it, another person, and then somebody else hears the same thing and, and they laugh about it, somebody else, they get very upset about it. One takes offense, one doesn't. You have to choose whether you're going to take offense. And there's a scripture that said, great peace are they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them. You can get to the point, and offend really means, it don't just mean emotional feeling, it means it, may, it stops you from doing what you were doing. When a person gets offended, they stop doing what they were doing. It, they stumble. And there are people who get offended, and so I was telling our uh, servant, our uh, uh, helps minister yesterday, that you have to have a relationship with the Lord that goes beyond the church, that goes beyond the pastor, so if, even if you got offended with me, you still keep serving the Lord. what Jesus do to you? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Whatever he says, he already said, okay? And so you're not discovering who Jesus is because he's already revealed himself in his word. So if you get offended with me, get offended with somebody else's church, come on, go, go find another church. Keep serving God. Are y'all following me? Don't fall off from the church because you get offended with a person. Jesus said, this is my church. Upon, the, upon this rock, I build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so, but, but oh, I got off. Okay, and so I used to tell my stories, and somebody got offended years ago, and uh, as I could see they were offended, and they were a leader. And I could see folks offended, but when our leaders get offended, okay, the attitude changes, and they're real close to me. If Mrs. Joyce was sitting here every time, and every, every time I got up, she would up here rolling her eyes at me. I'm like, okay, I got to bring Joyce in. We got some problems here because she leads my, my corporate prayer. And obviously she got some issues and, and I can't be having her spew that over the congregation. So I had a lead I could see was offended because nothing I said was funny anymore. Now y'all know I'm funny sometimes. If you don't laugh at all my jokes, you laugh at some of them. Some of them you try not to laugh, you find yourself laughing. But if you ain't laughing at nothing, or either you are greatly depressed Okay, or there's some offense. And so I said, what's going on? And the person was offended. So she said to me, she said, 
You tell these same old stories all the time. I've been in this church for 10 years. You just keep telling these same stories. And I said, well, obviously, when you came here, those stories were blessing you. And I said, and there's people still getting blessed by these stories. And I said, so it sound like you, sound like you, you offend him. Right? Well, I'm, we think about going. I said, well, you probably do need to leave. I ain't trying to make nobody stay. I didn't make And so, but I got a little triggered. So every time I go tell one of my stories, I keep hearing that. Nobody trying to, you tell the same stories all the time. <laughs> and nobody trying to hear your stories. So a lot of times I go to tell my story and I'll rush through my story come like, people thinking, he telling the same old stories again. But every time I tell a story, there's somebody ain't heard my story. Amen. So I ain't talking to you, I'm talking to one who ain't heard it. <laughs> huh. <clears throat> March of 1988, we were still renting a place just to have our services. We didn't have our own building. Right down the street here, some of you ever want to take a ride, just go down right across from, from the uh, DJJ and the prison system down there. It's on the left side, 4921 Broad River Road, the Postal Working Union Hall. And we were renting that just for our services. We had our services there on Sundays for $50, and it had Tuesday night. The reason why we did Tuesday night versus Wednesday night is because they had their union meeting on the first Tuesday, which they still do, on the first Tuesday of every month, and so we knew we would have to change it so rather than changing once a month, we, we, uh, on the first Wednesday, rather, we just had our uh, Bible studies on Tuesday night. And so we were renting here. We, we came there in, like, September of 1996. Our church is now, uh, we started in April of 96. We had our first service. That's why we're celebrating 28 years this month. And so we came into that building just renting just space in April of 1996. And then I kept believing God, believing God that we'd have our own building. And I was riding around, and I had an op we had now had an opportunity to rent what y'all hear us talk about, to lease the place at 4921 Broad River Road. It's really, it's, it's, it's really nostalgic. It's, it's, the place is falling apart right now uh, because if any place the right direction leaves, it go down, Lord Jesus. Okay. And, um, but so, so we had the opportunity to lease this place. And we went in there, and we saw what we were going to have to do. That's what you hear me say, that one of the first things we said, we're going to have to put up sheetrock, okay? We're going to put up sheetrock, and me and Elder Perry, we, we put up the sheetrock. But he didn't know nothing about putting up sheetrock, and I didn't know nothing about putting up sheetrock. And we just put, trying to put, I didn't know sheetrock from pebble rock, okay? And we trying to put up the sheetrock, and we trying to hammer into, into cinder blocks, Okay, he would hammer five, ten times. I hammer five times. He hammer another five times, and then we get one nail in. <laughs> and then finally, somebody came along and said, "This ain't how you do this. You gotta first put up studs and you put insulation." We found that out later. Okay, but anyway, so we so we have this opportunity to get this building, and so I uh, and the Lord spoke to me, said, and I, had, I said, you, you, we're going to need $10,000, $10,000 to pay the deposit and to renovate what we can to start having services there. And Pastor Marsh and I, we have been believing God for a home. We, now, this is 1996. We've been married 11 years. We have four small children. We've never owned a home. We've gone from state to state, but never owned a home. And so uh, when I left Corporate America in, 90, in, in, in 97, okay, um, in, not, yeah, in, in 97, this is now 1998, in 97, I, we have, I have $5,000 that have been put aside little by little over the last uh, seven, eight years or so. That $5,000, and as far as I know, the, unless the law has changed, you could use your, you, you could take money out of your 401k or 403b for, for a First time home payment, a down payment. That was our plan. We had $5,000. It's the most money I had ever seen at one time. And I didn't even see it. It was on paper. Okay? I had never seen that much money. At, well, uh, uh, y'all know about when I was wasting the money my mother gave me. Okay? But, but it's the, since I've been married, it's the biggest lump sum of money we had, $5,000. And so we would go around from time to time just look for a house. Look for a house. So we got our down payment. We got this $5,000. Now, $5,000 back then could, could probably get you something. $5,000, you need to still be praying today. You need to pray and have some friends and some special favor. 
okay? <laughs> but $5,000, we could, that was our down payment. And so now we're getting ready to get this building, and I'm excited about it. And, and just like I do with our super seed, I know whatever I ask y'all to do, I got to leave. Now, we have a church of about 20 to 40 people. They're still rel rel relatively new, okay? Uh, we only been going a year and a half. People still looking at me funny. I'm from New Jersey. Y'all know how some of y'all still got issues with folks from up north, okay? And so I, 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 got, I need to raise $10,000, and the Lord speaks to me and says, take the $5,000 that I gave you and take it up to Mount Moriah and slay it there. Some of y'all get that later. I'll work it in. Okay, sacrifice that five thousand dollars, and so Lord had been dealing with me about it for a couple of weeks. I know I need to see this often. I'm going to ask the people to give whatever they could give, and I remember somebody came and brought a whole bunch of change. Somebody just bought. They had been saving quarters and dimes. Uh, that ended up being, if I remember, about five hundred dollars. Somebody gave, and we, we we counted all the money, and everybody got involved. But so we were getting ready to go into service, and I told Pastor Marsh I finally got enough courage to tell her. I said, honey, um, the Lord's dealing with me about us sowing that $5,000 to get our first building. And she said, okay, I'll pray about it. Now, we're now around the corner, like on Piney Grove, the place right north of Piney Grove. And I said, well, pray quick, because the Lord told me to tell people we're going to give it today. And she said, huh? But about somewhere between there and the time I got to receive the offering, she told me, okay, go ahead and give it. But she gave it, but she was crying. I mean crying. We went out to dinner that day at the place that, where, now they got a quick trip, there was a restaurant there called Hilltop, where we used to eat, and where, where it was a buffet, where we, where, where we told the kids to lie and don't say how old you are. Because <laughs> kids under a certain age was free. You know how kids, they, they, they proud when they get older, you know, like five and older free. And we, we, we went there one, one Sunday, and they said, how old are you, little girl? I said, oh, shut up. <laughs> Kendra said, six. I said, y you're five. Said, no, I, I was sick last week. <laughs> shut up. Okay. We went out to dinner that Sunday, bad went to worse. The kids spilled something on Marsha's dress. So it was after church, which we didn't sacrifice our $5,000 for a house. We don't know where that's gonna come from. And now her dress is all messed up. And so Marsha released the seed, but she sowed in tears, okay? She sowed in tears. But the text promises us, the text promises us that those who sow in tears will reap in joy. That's 1998. Now, fast forward about two years. About two years, 2020, 2020, yeah, uh, uh, 2000. 2000, somewhere 2000, 2001, probably around 2000. We have an opportunity to get our first house. I'm just so happy we got approved. Some of you, I, some of you, I, I'll never forget y'all, so I, I rejoice with y'all too, amen? I'm so happy we got approved. I mean, that was, the, that was uncommon favor. And by the way, y'all, Don Staley didn't come up with the term uncommon favor. Mike Murdoch came up with the term uncommon favor. Mike Murdoch got all kind of books about uncommon favor, so I know you might think like <laughs> that, that Don Staley is the, is the progenitor of the phrase uncommon favor, okay? Um, but it was uncommon favor that we got approved. I mean, I could run and jump on shout out because we got approved, and then so we go to sit down about the, the, about the house, and we sit down with the realtor. He said, well, you probably only need about $5,000 to close. I said, oh, Jesus, I, I needed a catcher. I, like, no, no, we got approved. I'm thinking now, no, you need money to close. And so I'm getting ready to end the whole deal and cancel it. He said, well, you, well can we close such? Will you have it? And I got to say, well, and Marcia said, yes, we'll have it. I said, what? <laughs> I, we gonna, I looked at her. She said, we'll have it. We got it. I said, this woman and pulled the, the black woman thing on me. Black women, y'all know her because a lot of your mamas told y'all, don't be dependent on no man. Always have your own little something on the side. 
And I figured now, for the last 15 years, 13, 15, she's been putting something on the side. And now when it's time for the down payment, she got it. And I've been struggling all these years and she got this money on the side. And I said, we got it? We have, she said, yeah, we have it. I said, okay. So, I, I, so later on, I, I, after I said, no, we got it? What count is it in? Where? Is it under the mattress? Where you got a safe, you got a safe deposit back? So, so she said, the Lord told me when I release that seed for the ministry, we will have it. Now, we didn't physically have it, but she had a word from God that when we go to close on a house, we will have it. Now, my wife, really especially back then, she always operated at a whole nother level of faith than me. And so, I didn't, again, I used all my faith. I was like faith deplenished because we got to prove. Now I gotta, we gotta get approved and I gotta believe for a down payment too. And then, and then we were talking about furniture. Cause she said, now all this old furniture we didn't have that Mother Betty gave us that we took from New Jersey to Maine to South Carolina. You know, we, we ain't have no, I'm, I'm like, please woman. I gotta believe for the house, the down payment. Now you want new furniture? Boy, you just asking for a lot. But she just believed God and she said, we will have what we need. And I jumped on her back of faith. I said, I'm going to ride your faith on this one, okay? Listen, somebody got to be believing in the house. I said, somebody got to be believing in the house. In Acts 27, when that ship was about to go down and they thought everything, Paul came forth and said, I, he said, be of good cheer, I believe God. He said, I don't even care if y'all don't, I believe God and it shall be as it was told me. And so she stood on this word that because she had sown this precious seed, and released it, and can I, to this day, I don't know how we had it, and I don't know if we talked to somebody, but this I do remember. I remember we were talking about it, and we had a, the few members we had, somebody decided they wanted to get together with the church and help the church get us a down payment. And then, then the scuttlebutt started. People start, I start getting me, people talk, you know, ain't nobody help me with no down payment for my house, and I got it one Sunday. I said, I don't need nothing from you people. No, I stopped the whole thing. I said, don't give us a dime. Well, everything, whatever God said, he will provide for us. I don't want anybody to give us anything. And I shut, you remember that? I shut the whole thing down. And I don't even remember how the money came. But we had it. And not only that, then we got all new furniture. I mean, all new furniture. Debt free, not now, y'all don't even understand. I was, I was the one who went around to the Goodwill and the antique places. Pastor Mark said, we ain't doing that no more. That is over. So fear home now. And she got with this other pastor's wife, um, Sister Booker, and they, they, we went to these places, and they, and they in there, and, and she, she had to tell her, her, her faith friend, her, her battle buddy, said, Mark, you like that? You want that? Well, we're going to claim that. And I, I, would see the, I would see the price, and they put their hands on it. I'm like, y'all better call on Jesus. <laughs> and and they were, they're walking around, and they're putting their hand on stuff and claiming stuff, and everything that they claim, we got it debt free. <laughs> and it all happened because we released a precious seed. It was the most money I had ever sown at one time. And to us, it was sacrificing so much. The text, verse one gives us a conclusion of a traumatic time and traumatic event for the people of God. <clears throat> what had happened was they rebelled against God. They were taken as slaves in exile to a foreign country, but now they're restored and they come back to their land. And so the writer says, when the Lord turned our captivity, when the Lord brought back his exiles, the New Living Translation says, to Jerusalem, it was like a dream. Can I tell you, God can help you live your dream. We're living our dream. God can help you live your dream. I don't know what your dream is, but God can fulfill dreams. He said, we were like those that dream. He said, we responded with laughter. We responded with singing, 
We responded with joy, and then they responded with a testimony. They said, we got to tell our story even if you heard our story. The Lord has done great things for us. Wherever we're glad. We were exiled. We were slaves. We didn't have our own land. We didn't have our own houses. But God brought us back and restored our fortunes. And we were like them that dream. I got a testimony. The Lord has done great things for me. Where are we glad? And not only that, it said before they even said it, the folks who knew what they had been through, the heathen, the people who laughed at them, said, man, God done great things for them. You know, I went to school with her. We came out of the same place. We was in a project with them. We used to live in the same trailer park. We, from, we both from the same town with one light. But look at them now. The Lord has done great things for them. Can I tell you, you're really not blessed the way God wants you to be blessed until your enemies see you blessed. Until the doubters see you blessed. Until the sinners see you blessed. And they envy us. Look at somebody say, you're going to see me blessed. Glory to God. So then, verse 4, they, 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 had, they gave God a prayer request. They said, do it again, Lord. Turn it again. Turn it again. Turn it. We had a new season in my life. God, do it again. God, God I, I know you worked a miracle before, but I'm at a different season. I need to do something new for me now. Lord, I thank you that you gave me the down payment, but Lord, now we need some furniture in this house. Ain't no sense of having all these rooms and this look like some museum about folks who used to live here. If you gave me this house, now you're going to fill it with all good things. Look at somebody say, God going to do it again. Do it again. Throw your head back, say, do it again, Lord, do it again, do it again. I don't know what your again is, but I'm here to let somebody know that God will do it again. If he brought you out before, he'll bring you out again. If he healed you before, he will heal you again. If he turned it around before, he will turn it around again. If he worked a miracle before, he's still a miracle worker. He will do it again. Somebody shout, do it again, Lord. Verse 5 of Psalm 26, he tells the process of how it happened, how God turned the captivity around. He said, we sowed some seed. And through sowing seed, we realized not just seed, but we sowed precious seed. Everybody say precious seed. On Super Seed Sunday, and in this season, many of y'all are going to sow precious seed. Now, precious seed... It's not what everybody sows. That $5,000 to me was precious seed. For me to sow $5,000 today is not precious seed. It take a whole lot more in this season of my life to be precious seed. You follow me? But where I was, that was precious seed. Now, what does it mean to be precious? Precious means beloved. Precious means it's dear to you. Precious means it's cherished. Cherished is something you want to hold on closely to. Like, 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 a, like, the, like all you women who have, a, have your first child. Your child too good to go to, to go to our nursery. This is precious seed. Nobody can take care of my child but me. Now, I ain't putting my child no children in no nursery. This is precious seed. You have about two or three or four. You all looking for church. Y'all have no children church up here? I ain't coming. Y'all have no nursery. I, I got to stay home unless you got somebody to take care of my children. But in the beginning, it's precious seed. Can nobody touch your child? Precious. It's cherished. Precious also means very costly. Like the woman with the alabaster box. They were so precious. They said it's a waste to give this to Jesus. And precious means highly valuable. In the context of the test, several things make this seed precious seed. Number one, precious is when you had other plans for it. You had other plans for it. In the case of how I began this message, that $5,000, that was our house down payment. Not second house down payment, not investment house down payment, not extra house down payment. This was going to finally cause us to have to be a homeowner. 
Now, y'all need to understand, down here, down south, home ownership is a lot, lot bigger than it is up north. Some of y'all understand that. There are people up, up, up in New York, in these metropolitan, they will rent their whole life and tell you about their apartments. And they are proud of their apartments, okay? Down south, you're like, well, what, what's wrong with you? I had people, I, I, I've had brothers come to me and say, well, you know, I want to marry her, but I realize I don't have a house yet. I said, well, who told you? But their parents told them, you got to have a house before you get married. And so I have a different mentality there, because I like, sometimes you ain't going to have no house until you get married. Because he that uh, finds a wife, finds a good thing, and obtains the favor. You better get a house, get your wife so you can get a house. You ain't, you ain't going to get no house by yourself. You need some favor. <laughs> And so, uh, so, so home ownership is a big thing in the South. And home ownership for a preacher like me who's preaching prosperity, who preached that God will, I'm reading the scripture, God will give you houses. I got to own my own house. This was precious seed. Um, it's like the widows, the widows might, um, like the, the widows and the son who Elijah, Elijah came and spoke to who said, we're going to, in 1 Kings 17, he comes and asks this woman, do you have any bread? Or, uh, she said, I just got a little handful of flour in a bin, and I got a little oil in a jar, and I'm going to gather a couple of sticks. I'm going to go in and prepare it for, for me and Daniel, I mean me and my son, that we may eat it and die. You didn't catch that, did you, Pastor Marsh? He wasn't even listening. He wasn't even listening. In, in your watch, follow me on social media. You also had some fried fish yesterday. Oh, we don't get no fried fish in my house. So this, this was, this was, and I, as I was posting, give me a post, I said, I, I got this fried fish because Daniel home. <laughs> That's why I got this fried fish. She told me that's the case. She said she already planned on making some, uh-huh. But, but, but some, y'all, y'all know if I really, really want to eat good, I text the kids, don't y'all want to come over? <laughs> y'all, y'all come on over. I mean, all of a sudden, a new, a new grace come on, a new anointing. She bringing food from afar. <laughs> this woman said, just got a little bit, just going to eat it for me and my son. It was precious. And he tells her, make me a cake first. That's first thing, 17. As I alluded to earlier, Abraham was required to sow the precious seed. God tells him, bring your son uh, in Genesis 22. Bring, bring your son up to your only, he said, your only son. And God, God, God like dug it in too. Bring, bring me your son, the only son who you love. Know what he was saying? Don't bring Ishmael. You didn't really want him anyway. This is the, bring the precious one. He said, bring the one you love. Mm. He probably could have sacrificed Ishmael. But God said, in Isaac, your seed is going to be excited. Bring Isaac to the mountain and sacrifice him there. And when he raises his hand to sacrifice Isaac, God said, now I know that you love me and fear me, seeing, seeing you have not withheld the precious. The proof of whether we really believe God and trust God is will we ever release the precious? Not just anything, the precious. Secondly, what makes something precious is that you really need it. We really needed that $5,000. It took years to put that money aside. And it was done, and it was done because it was done, it was done uh, uh, systematically. It was being done out of my paycheck. Okay? Don't, don't get mad. But the reason why we, how, how we became millionaires is that we had to do it systematically. Okay? The great, and some of y'all don't realize, the greatest thing that ever happened in the Western economy was to be able to do stuff automatically online. Some of y'all don't realize that. If, okay, because y'all know it takes a lot of discipline to write those checks. That's why, that's, that, that, that's why a lot of us, we used to be late. I meant to put it in the mail. I meant to write the check. It's a whole lot of processes versus just doing, doing like this. And then you can set it and forget it. And you can set it automatically. And then, so what I used to do, I had a, when I first started with, with uh, Aetna, my, my, my manager sat me down. He said, listen, uh, at, Aetna, he said, at that time, corporations don't do this anymore. He said, we have a 100% match 401k. 
And where we were then, I started that job in 1988, okay? Uh, Just about to have two children. I started that job in 1988, I think of, uh, uh, 88, 88, you born 88, right? 88, right? 86, 88, yeah. I think Tyler born 86, 88, no, he born 89. Okay, I'm I'm trying to remember. About about to have have two children, and my manager said, he said, uh, start off at the lowest, 2%. He said, do it automatically. He said, every time you get a raise, he said, raise it a percentage. He taught me that. He said, if you do it that way, you never miss it. You have more money coming home, but you also automatically have, so you, you don't wait till you get the money and then decide you're going to do it. He said, when it, before it comes, and so, and so that's how we started putting, putting money aside. It was precious, but that was, my, that was my FSM money. FSM, for something money. Don't raise your hand if you got some for something money. Okay? Okay? A lot of us have some for something money. You know, when we say for something, we mean it ain't for super C. It's for this, it's for that, it's for something, and what also, you know, you really need it, and it also looks like something will be forfeited. Looks like if I do this, I can't do that. That's what that woman tried to explain to Elijah. I'm going to eat this, me and my son will eat this, we're going to die. He said, well, make me one first. And so uh, when he says, make me one first, the implication is there's going to be a second. You didn't catch that. The man of God says, make me one first, means there's going to be something else that follows this. She wasn't thinking first, she's thinking last. He said, but make me one first, because the man of God by faith was saying, this is not going to be your last supper. This is not going to be your last dime. This is not going to be your last $5,000. Looks like you're gonna, something's going to be forfeited. She said, if I make you one, then me and my son not going to eat. But God, she was thinking about a meal, and God had one translation says a whole year in mind for her. The case of the widow's might in, in Mark 12, 41 through 44. The Bible says Jesus sat near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowd was dropping in their money. Jesus was watching what, what the folks was giving. Now, y'all, y'all, y'all know <laughs> if y'all go and receive an offering, I said, come and bring your offering. Everybody bring your envelope. And, I, and, 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 and y'all bring the envelope. And I, I open up every envelope and say, that's all you give them, $10? Now, look, look. You didn't mind your business. I don't have to get nothing. Jesus was watching those folks give it. He saw everything. Can I tell you, Jesus still watching. Look at your name and say, he's still watching. He watched it. And Bob said, many rich people, they put in large amounts, New Living Translation said. And this poor woman came and dropped in two small coins, and Jesus called disciples on him and said, look, 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 come here, come here, let me tell you something. I'm telling you the truth. This poor woman has given more than all the others who are making contributions. Well, well, I don't understand that, Jesus. He just gave, they, they've been given these large amounts and explains in verse 44, they gave a tiny part of their surplus. But she, as poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. This woman gave the precious. This woman gave her for something money. Something she was dependent to live on. Thirdly, what makes it precious is that it's the best you have. Look at your neighbor and say, give it the best you got. Giving it the best that I got, baby, Jesus. I'm sorry. Give it the best I got, Jesus. Okay? It's the best you have. In Genesis 4, chapter, verse 3 and 4, we read about Cain and Abel. And the Bible says that one was keeper of livestock, the other one was the keeper of the ground. And verse 3 says, and when it came to time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Just some of his crops. Okay? I think the King James says an offering. It almost minimizes it. He, he, he just brought some. But look at verse 4 says, and Abel brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn land from his flock. And the Lord accepted Abel and his gift. 
Understand this from the scripture. Your gift represents you. Your offering represents you. Okay? And so if it's Mother's Day and I hand my wife $2 and say, baby, I think you've been a good mother. She's going to look at me. Now, if my grandbaby, one of them came and said, Nana, you're such a nice Nana. I want to give you this. Oh, this is you. You're probably going to start crying. Me, I'm almost going to get cussed out. Almost. But because she's a woman of God, she won't do it. But almost. Because that doesn't represent me. You need to understand, your giving represents you. Never forget that. It represents you. And the Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but Cain, he did not. Because Cain just brought something, and Abel brought the gift. The, the gift. He brought the pressure. The Amplified said, and Abel brought an offering of the finest of the firstborn of his flock and the fat portion, and the Lord had respect, regard for Abel and his offering. When you sow and give God the best you have, it's proof that you honor the Lord. It's proof that you honor the Lord. The word honor comes from the uh, Hebrew words, particularly in the Old Testament, kabod. It means to make heavy, meaning it's very profound, it's meaningful to me, it's, it's heavy, okay? People who honor me, if I say something, they, take it, they, they don't take it lightly. Other people say, I don't, I don't care what, I don't care what Pastor Bailey said. That's what he said that, okay? So, so one honors me, so my word is heavy. The other one doesn't honor me and makes light of it. When we honor God, he's important, he's heavy. He's weighty in our lives. And so when we give the best, it shows that we honor the Lord. First Samuel 2, chapter and verse 30, it says, uh, wherefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that the house and the house of their father should walk before me forever. God said, now I told you what I want you to do. But now the Lord says, far be it from me for those who honor me, I will honor. Those who make me heavy, I'll make you heavy. Those who, who put me high, I'll put you high. Those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. So if you honor me, I'll honor you. You make little of me, I'll let you stay little. Now, that's the word of the Lord. I ain't making that up. And so that's why the Bible tells us in Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, honor the Lord, how? With our substance, our possessions, and the first fruits of our increase. And God said, watch me honor you. You make me big, I'll make you big. You esteem me, I'll esteem you. You, you magnify me, I'll magnify you. Verse 10, and so your bonds going to be filled with plenty. And your vats, your storage place is going to overflow with new, with new wine. That's what makes it precious. Fourthly, what makes something precious is the latter part. When you give something precious, sometimes it makes you weep. Now y'all know, Weeping is different than crying. Crying is, <laughs> somebody weeping, oh, 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 oh. you know, it's almost uncontrollable when you're weeping. It's, uh, uh, you're weeping, you, you have a, you have a, you have a <laughs> some, some of us, some of us, we used to get, uh, I'm gonna use nice words, disciplined by our parents. And crying wasn't good enough for them. He said, <laughs> oh, 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 you think I'm playing with you, huh? They're going a little bit deeper. They want you going, ha, 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 please, ha. Now you understand. They just want you to cry. They wanted you to weep. I have one, 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 one of my sons, it was Daniel. Da Daniel, to this day, he's the most emotionless out of all of our children. He's the most emotionless. And so to this day, you, know, you don't know what he's thinking. You know, his coaches used to ask me, and seemed like I can't get to him. You know, is he understanding me? I said, that's the way he is. Said, he listening, okay? Uh, but then I remember one time was, he did something, little boy, I was spanking him. He said, uh-huh, mm. uh huh Then he looked at me and said, come on, dad. No, boy, you better weep. Come on, Dad. 
Weeping is emotional. And sometimes we get depressed, it makes you weep. We weep, listen, because we're hurting, either physically or emotionally. Initially, when we gave that seed, Marcia was hurting. It wasn't physical. And she, she later talked about it. She said she told the Lord about it. She said, Lord, I made all these sacrifices because you told me. And we made all these sacrifices for ministry. I left my family. We moved here. We moved there. We would love to be back in New Jersey, but we're doing what you told us to do. And now the, the one thing we had to get a house, now you're asking that too? He was hurting. Sometimes we also weep because we're grieving. When in grief, there's a sense of loss. We grieve when someone or something dies. I saw a story, I, I, it happened a, uh, a couple years ago, maybe a year ago. I happened to stumble across, now I don't know how stuff comes up on your timeline on uh, X, formerly Twitter, but someone, it, it, was a, it was a wife of a known country singer. I don't know country music like that, so I don't know, okay, who it was. But she says, she's, and she showed a picture of her and the children. She said, many of you know that me and so-and-so are getting divorced. She said, and I am so hurt. She said, for, for now, and the person had acknowledged it, for like the eighth time, now he's had an affair. These are the ones that I know about. And I cannot take it anymore. So we are getting divorced. So she chooses to get divorced. But then she says, but I grieve for my family. And I grieve for the home I thought my children would have. And I grieve that my children are going to have to split holidays between me and their father. And I grieve that we can't be in one place at the same time. Even though she, I'm done with this man, I'm grieving what I thought we were going to have. Are y'all with me here? And so she was grieving the family and the home that she thought she would have. And we also weep because sometimes it looks like permanent loss. Sometimes when God tells you to get depressed, it looks like in your mind, for you can see, you know what it takes to have this, to get this, that 5,000 weeks. It took years. We never had surplus money. We were just li literally trying to make it at, at that season of our life, just trying to keep the rent paid, just, just, just trying to keep the lights on. Man, and then one time, we got to play. You had all the tillies on at one time. What you talking about? Okay? Some, some of y'all don't know. I know what it is to struggle. I know this. I, 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 told, I told somebody, I was, I was talk, talk, talking to someone this week, and, uh, and they were saying, and they said, the person looked like they were going to lose some money, and they said, well, it was only like $1,500 a week. I said, okay, rich man. Because when you're struggling, $50 to $100 a week is a lot. Amen. And so, and so I, I, I knew what it, what it was to struggle, and I didn't see how we were going to have that. We didn't see how we could have it, and it looks like it's going to be permanent loss. It looks like you won't see it again. Jacob had 12 sons. Pastor Martin mentioned this earlier. She didn't know what I'm going to preach about. He had 12 sons. The youngest two finally gets two sons from the wife he loved, which was Rachel, the good-looking, pretty one that he wanted from the beginning. And the father had to trick him to marry her. Now, you know it's bad when your father got to trick somebody to marry you. That's all I'm going to say. He had to trick. He had to trick Jacob. He, he said, well, that, that, that's, that's what we got to do. We got to do. Okay? And she kept having babies. He had 10 of them. Then finally, the Lord opens up the womb of the one he loved, Rachel. He has two, has two sons. Joseph than Benjamin. He loved his son so much he gave Joseph this coat of many colors. Back in the 70s, we call that psychedelic. <laughs> gave him a psychedelic coat. Okay? And his brothers were mad with him. And then he, he, he was young and probably a little arrogant. He knew, he knew he was the favorite child. And then he's, he's, he, tells, he tells his brothers, he said, you know, I had this dream. And in this dream, all y'all are bowing down to me. Like I was up here, like y'all down here. <laughs> and all y'all were bowing down to me. And then he said, I had another dream. Not only you, my, my mom and dad, they was also bowing down to me. And his brother said, we're going to kill this dreamer. 
One of them said, no, let's not kill them, let's sell them. And they sold them down to Egypt. But they came home and told the father that a wild beast caught him and killed him. So his father thinks that Joseph is dead. It's years and years and years going down. There's a famine, and now they got to go down to Egypt to get food to be sustained because God gave Joseph, after years of going through, elevates him to be the prime minister over, over Egypt, and they come down there, and he has, he's the one who's giving out the food and the rations, and he comes, they don't know who he is. And he comes down and asks, they come to buy food, and he, Joseph tricks him. He said, put, take all the money, give them their food, but put the money back in the bags and take it. And they, they go back, and they realize, oh, my goodness. So we, we still have the money. They're, they're going to get it. And then, then, then they need more. And the, but then Joseph says, he says, uh, and when you, he, he, he said, he, he messing with him. He asked, do you have any other? He said, yeah, we got this younger brother. Um, he, he got one other brother. His name is Benjamin. That's the precious one. We have Benjamin. He's the son of my father's old age. That's Joseph's full brother. The other of his half brothers. And Joseph says, um, bring him back when you come. He said, no, no, I'm not going to be able to. He said, no, you bring him. He said, if you don't bring him back, you won't get back to see me and y'all won't get any more food. He comes back. He tells his father. Father said, we got to go back and get some more. He said, well, we can't go back unless we take Benjamin with us. Jacob said, no, you can't take Benjamin. No, 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 no. You already taken my other son who I love, who now, as far as I know, has been ripped to pieces and dead. You cannot take Benjamin. That's the precious. He said, Dad, but the only way we can, he said, we got it. He, and then his, his brother says to him, he said, well, Dad, listen, I promise you, I promise you, we're gonna, we, we, we'll, we'll bring him back. He said, listen, I'm telling you, I will die if something happens to Benjamin takes Benjamin down to Egypt. And they get down there as, and Joseph says, is talking to them. And they find out, bring, have the bags. And, and so uh, they said, well, uh, Joseph says, all right, all the rest of y'all can go. Leave him. He's going to be my slave. Benjamin. And I believe it was Simeon who says, can we talk? Please, can we talk? takes him aside, and he tells him, listen, tells him the whole story. My father had, had 12 sons, and he had this, and th th please, please, I will become your slave, but I promise my father I will definitely bring the precious back. Otherwise, he's going to die. And as he tells the story, and because Benjamin is there, it melts Joseph's heart. Melts Joseph's heart, and Joseph reveals to them. I was reading this this morning. I mean, that, that, that was, that's really an emotional thing of you. We just read through these scriptures. Can you imagine all these years, all these years, all these years? He said, I'm your brother. I'm your brother. I'm your brother, the one who you sold into slavery. Yes, it's me. Now, that's a message that says, I don't look like what I've been through. <laughs> Joseph didn't look nothing like what he'd been through to the point they didn't even recognize him. They didn't recognize him physically. They didn't recognize his status. There's no way that could be him. Can I tell you, when you release the precious, God can cause you not to look like what you've been through. The precious melts his heart. Then Joseph lays out a whole plan. He said, go bring your father. Hey, all y'all come down, you're going to live in Goshen. And he said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. God sent me here so I can preserve y'all. The revelation of provision came when the precious was released. Precious looks like you won't see it again. Let me finish this here. It looks like it's dead when you get the precious. It looks like it's dead. It looks like it's over. John 12, 24. <coughs> Jesus says, I assure you, or verily or truly I say to you, that unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, unless your seed dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it re it produces much grain. I remember years ago, him Pastor Dollar tell a story. He was at he was at a, 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 he was at a place where you know he wasn't walking in abundance then, and he was at in this certain Lord said told him to give all he had, which was like ten thousand dollars. And he said, okay, he, and he said he asked Taffy about it. She agreed, and he gave the ten thousand dollars. He said, you know, it was a big place. He said he put it in the bucket. And he said he knew every, after he put that $10, 10000 he said he knew everywhere that bucket went. 
around that church. He just followed that one bucket up and down the aisle. He saw what Usher had it, and, and he was just following that. And the Lord said, listen, if I'm going to give you harvest, you have to let it go. You got to let it die. Look, somebody say, you got to let it die. You got to let it die. He said, unless that seed, you got to let it go and let it die. Watch this. Because the truth of the matter, but if it dies, it produces much grain. When you sow even financial seed in faith, particularly God told you, you got to let it die. Now watch this. <clears throat> because when it dies, it's buried. You think it's buried, but it's planted. Except it falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. So actually, when it's put in the ground, we don't call that we buried the seed. We did what? You plant the seed. The difference between burying and planting is expectation. Let me say, try this side. The difference between burying and planting is expectation. You got to expect because I obeyed God, something's about to be released in my life. Because I obey God, something's about to grow. And I say it all the time. When I obey God and sow the seed he tells me to sow, something is happening behind the scenes. Something's happening beneath the surface. I don't know how it happens. The Bible says that when you sow your seed, God waters the earth and it brings forth a bud and you don't know how. I don't know how God gonna get the down payment, but God got the down payment. I didn't know how God gonna supply the furniture, but God supplied the furniture. All I know is I obeyed God, gave him the precious, and it brought forth a harvest. I'm prophesying over the right direction this year as you prepare and get ready to sow your super seed, you're gonna receive a harvest that only the precious can bring forth. So there's a promised blessing at the end of the text, Psalm 126 and 5 and 6. He said there's a, there's a promise of a blessing that can only be harvested by sowing the precious seed. Okay? First of all, there's going to be joy because the scripture said weeping may endure for a night. But what's going to happen? Joy is coming. And look, look, somebody say joy is on the way. <laughs> Secondly, there's going to be rejoicing. Can I tell you what rejoicing is? Rejoicing is a replenishing of joy. Re rejoice is a replenishing of joy. And so you can go through things that look like it robs you all your joy. But when the harvest comes, man, it replenishes your joy. It puts dancing back in your feet. It puts clapping back in your hand. It puts a song back in your mouth. There will be rejoicing. And then the third thing he says, you're going to bring forth a great harvest. Those who sow in tears will reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth. I'm crying because it's precious. I'm crying because it's my last. I'm crying because I, be, because I think that this is all I'm going to have. I'm crying because I think I really need this. I'm crying because you don't know how long it took me to get this. But he that goes forth and weepeth, bearing precious. That's why it's precious. But shall doubtless, no doubt about it, God got a harvest in mind on the other side of the precious seed. There's no doubt about it. I believe God is going to be what he said. God's going to do just what he said. If you sow the precious seed, the harvest produces overflow. Watch this. Don't miss this. That you will get to the point that you don't always have to sow from the precious. Once the, come on, once the sheaves come in, I don't have to sow from the precious anymore. Now I'm sowing from the overflow. But can I tell you, you're not going to have overflow until you sow the precious. I said you're not going to have overflow until you sow the precious. Lord, I really need this, but I trust you. Lord, it took a long time to get this, but I trust you. It looked like it's going to be my last, but I trust you. It may not be much, but I trust you. I could have sold it, but I trust you. I plan to do something else with it, but I trust you. And God said, if you trust me, you're giving all you have, but that will never be all you have anymore. There's a blessing on the other side. There's abundance coming your way. Your broke days are about to be over. Your lack days are about to be over. Your struggle days are about to be over. Hallelujah. God getting ready to open up the floodgates. He's going to open up the floodgates. Those that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Those that sow in tears shall reap in joy. I mean, God just saying, I know this got to work. I'm obeying you. Just like the woman did. And she and he in her house didn't eat for many days. 
One seed can bring dividends for a lifetime. One seed can make you debt free. One seed can pay your child's tuition. One seed can open up a new level of receiving in your life. But you got to be willing to release the precious. Everyone standing. And no one leaving, please. You got to be willing to release the precious. Now listen to me. For many of us, this ain't even about super seed. This is just about tithing. It ain't talking about sowing a thousand, ten thousand, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand that some of us can do over the next couple of weeks. Some of you just about tithing. I just don't see. Because I really need this. I just don't see. I'm going to pay my rent. All my money spent. A little bit to buy some food. Baby need a pair of shoes. And I got a light bill due. Telephone disconnect. I'm waiting on my next paycheck. <laughs> Gotta be old enough to even know that song. <laughs> it's the precious. I would not be where I am. This ministry would not be where it is. We didn't sow the precious. Years ago, they may have forgotten. I didn't forget. Pastor called me a couple weeks ago, asked me to help him, give him some strategy to help his church raise his 300000 that he needs as he gets in his new building. He said, I remember years ago, and I really hadn't thought about it. It was 20 years ago plus. He said, I remember you stood up and you sold a $100,000 seed. That night we were, being, we were blessing Pastor Dollar. We had never done that before. Never done that before. And the people got up receiving the offering. They act like they were scared even received the offering. And me and Pastor Riley came forward. And he said, I'm giving $100,000. The Lord said, you match him. Our ministry was nowhere where it is now. Another time that precious was 3000 When we were in that building, now we can be able to go to the other side. We need to renovate it. I need the $30,000. By the time we looked at what it was going to take to expand that building. We had a building fund. The building was three thousand. The building fund was three thousand dollars. I was at a certain loss. Says so that I'm where I am now because I learned to obey God when it was precious. And I know some of you may think this is manipulation. Some of you may think what I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to stir up your faith. That's what that's what Elijah had to do with that woman. He said, God said, if you release it. The meal ain't going to run out. I just want to stir your faith. 